Today we'll be talking about our, our next topic in the class, which is stress strain diagrams. <clears throat> stress strain. Diagrams. Let me just draw an ex kind of an exemplary one. This is a uh, little bit of a cartoon, but we'll get the point across. So let's say we have here on the y-axis, it's going to be our stress. And then here on the x-axis, it's going to be strain. And so what we're interested in is for a given amount of strain in one dimension, how much stress develops in the object. And so these are called stress strain diagrams and they often have look something like this where there will be a straight region. Then it will plateau for a bit, come up, and then fall off. So let's label a few of these regions here for this stress strain diagram. The most important part for this class is this region right here, which we'll call the linear region. And again, the name is kind of self-explanatory. It's the region of strain where the relationship between the stress and the strain is a line. Okay, and so this has a constant slope here. Okay, a couple of other points of interest are these two here. We would call this point the proportional limit. And then this is going to be the yield stress. Okay, and at this point you can see the behavior of the material changes substantially. Where now you're getting strain without an increase in stress. And so we often call this region here perfect plasticity. Perfect plasticity. Because there's basically a plastic deformation that occurs here in this region. And then after a while, depending on the material, you hit a point where the material begins to harden again. Uh, all the internal slippage that's available in the material has been used up. It hits this point here, and then all of a sudden the material begins to harden again. And so we call this region here strain hardening. And then it gets to this top maximum level of stress, which is appropriately called ultimate stress, and then the material begins to fail and eventually fails completely. So this would be fracture or some other failure mechanism in the material. Okay, so basically in 203, in 203, We're only interested in this region, okay, in the linear region. We don't hardly even talk after this lecture about any of this behavior in here because it's all what we call nonlinear. So understanding the relationship between the stress and the strain becomes much more difficult than understanding it if it's just a linear relationship as shown here. So this slope here, which is just going to be basically a change in stress over a change in strain, is again, as we talked about last time, is going to be constant, and it's called the modulus of elasticity. So this, this curve here, 
that I'm showing is kind of prototypical of a steel where there's this linear region and again this slope this is a cartoon I mean this slope is actually extremely steep it would almost be indistinguishable from the vertical y-axis and then it, it yields and then there's a necking region in here where we have a lot of elongation without any inter buildup of stress and then it hardens and then it fractures and fails so this is this is kind of a prototypical stress strain curve for steel so every material is going to have a different stress strain curve and these stress strain curves are measured so these are measured measured data and then uh, once we do a tensile test or some other kind of test to gather this information we can go about using that information in an engineering context so if you consider another material some other kind of material let's say if you wanted if I asked you to say give me some prototypical stress strain curve for um, let's say a brittle material so if we're interested in understanding stress strain behavior for a brittle material let's say something like glass then you would anticipate that there would be a linear region quite steep and then there might be a little bit of deformation but then it would probably just break and just fail and so as you can see there's a big difference between a brittle material and steel which is uh, what we call a ductile material. Okay, another important concept that um, I'm positive I will test you on is the difference between elastic behavior and inelastic behavior okay so again we have two stress strain diagrams stress strain stress strain and we have a stress strain diagram that maybe goes something like this so when we load the material up, it comes up to this point maybe, and then when we unload the material, it actually traces the same path down to back to the origin. This is called elastic behavior. meaning that there was no kind of permanent deformation that set in. We elongated, we, def we deformed, there was some strain, and then once we unloaded, the material snapped right back along the same path that it came back to the origin. So that's elastic behavior. Inelastic behavior, on the other hand, may be something like this. So you load the material like that, and it gets to some point but then it traces a slightly different path when you unload it. Okay, and so this right here is some residual strain that is left in the material. So it doesn't have a perfectly elastic behavior. It has what we call an inelastic And again, we're painting these classes of materials with a really, really broad brush. There are a lot of nuances and many different kinds of materials. Um, again, let me point out in this class, we are exclusively dealing with elastic materials. So if I go back to the previous slide, as I said before, in this class, we're 
exclusively dealing with materials in the linear region. So that's criteria number one. And then we are adding to that this requirement that they're elastic. Okay. So in this class, we study materials that are appropriately named linearly elastic materials. And that's the basis for the entire class is that our materials will behave both linearly, which is one concept, and elastically, which is another. That's very important. And I always test students every year on, the, on these two concepts, so keep that in mind. Now, because we're in this linear elastic regime, something interesting happens that we can take advantage of in relating stress and strain. So if we look again at a stress-strain diagram, okay, so we know we're only dealing with this linear regime. We know there's a constant slope. Okay. And we relate now, because of, there's a linear relationship between stress and strain, they can be related in a very simple way using a single constant, which 
we'll call capital E. And this is called, commonly called, Young's modulus, modulus of elasticity. Young's modulus. And so E, what is E? Well, it's nothing more than the slope of the linear region of a stress strain diagram. So again, you can see how easy it is to relate now stress to strain, at least in one dimension. There's just a, a, this nice single constant E that, again, this constant is going to be measured in the lab for different kinds of linear elastic materials. And so you can see that the more, the larger E is, the more stress develops for a given amount of strain. So if this was a hard steel, for example, this would be a very large number because a small amount of strain is going to generate a lot of internal, internal force measured in the stress. If it's a soft material, like say rubber, this is going to be a smaller value. And in fact, for rubber, it's not even a very good example because it doesn't really even have a linear region. Okay. So related to this concept here between stress and strain is another concept called Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio. And this is, again, another measured quantity, and it essentially kind of encodes the intuitive understanding that we have of a material. As you stretch it, it in one direction, it shrinks in the other. And as you compress it in one direction, it will get larger in the other, right? Because you're, you're trying to conserve, conserve mass to some effect, and so there's kind of this... this, this uh, this uh, necking that occurs when you elongate a material. If we're again talking about the linear regime, there's a very simple way to compute Poisson's ratio. This is the Greek letter nu that's commonly used to denote Poisson's ratio. And it's going to be minus epsilon prime epsilon, okay, where this is the lateral strain. lateral strain over axial strain. Right? And so again, this isn't doing nothing more than capturing uh, the in our intuitive understanding that when you elongate an object, it gets thinner. Right? Okay. So, it's kind of measuring the strain that's coming from, from this lateral strain. It's coming from that. Okay, and that, then a simple rearranging means that you can relate lateral strain to axial strain through this constant Poisson's ratio, which again is unitless because both of these strains are unitless. And so we have that relationship. Uh, as well. And so this is measured also. Okay, so nu is a measured quantity, E is a measured quantity, and we're starting to develop some understanding, some picture of how the internal deformations strain in an object are related to the internal forces which are measured through stress. Now you may be asking why, as I said before, is linear last elasticity such a big deal? And the reason is, is because engineers generally trying to try to design uh, structures or objects to perform in the linear elastic regime. So you could imagine if they built a skyscraper that was designed to perform in this inelastic regime, that would be a pretty scary skyscraper to be in because of the, the amount of deformations that would be allowed. And so we as engineers we tend to try and build, especially civil engineers, um, we try and build structures so that their performance given expected loads stays in this linear elastic regime uh, so that we have 
good control over over the behavior and the life and the um, performance of the building. Okay, so we'll move on to an example now that <laughs> brings together some of these ideas. So in this example, we're going to have a bar with a circular cross-section subject to our load. It's going to have a diameter, D, equal to 10 millimeters. Okay, and somebody's going to tell us what the material is. So in this case, the material is 7075T6, which is a type of aluminum alloy. Okay. And the change in D, or the elongation that occurs because of the applied load P, is measured to be 0.016. Okay, so the first thing that you should think about here is does the theory that we've developed where everything is linear, everything is elastic, um, does that all make sense here? And the first thing that I often look at is kind of the size of the object, so the characteristic dimension. So here the diameter is 10 millimeters, so the length is maybe 100 millimeters or so, but you can see that in any case that characteristic length is much larger than that deflection. So that tells you that we're in this small displacement linear regime. Also, we look at this material over here and we say, are, are these homogeneous isotropic, is aluminum generally considered to be a homogeneous isotropic material? And the answer is yes. And then further, the assumption of course is that these act through the centroid and that the cross-section is not changing from left to right. So we know that for this particular problem all of the assumptions are satisfied and we can move forward using the theory that we've developed up to this point. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is let's look up some material properties. So this is a well understood aluminum alloy and all of the pertinent material properties have been measured and tabulated. So you can look them up in the back of the book. And in this case, Young's modulus is going to be 72 gigapascals. And Poisson's ratio is going to be one third. And the yield stress, we'll call sigma y, is going to be 480 megapascals. And so yield stress is important. It's, often may not enter directly into the, our calculations because we are going to be in the linear regime but it's important to to know it's important to make sure that anything we design stays below this yield stress so it's a very important thing because if it gets above the yield stress then we're leaving the linear regime and the theory that we're using no longer is appropriate for what we're trying to do okay so let's now answer a few questions so the first thing we want to do is compute the lateral strain of the material. Okay, and the lateral strain again is just going to be epsilon prime. It's going to be delta D over D, which is again it's going to be negative. So it's um, minus zero point. 0 0.016 millimeters over 10 millimeters. Okay, so you might ask, well, why is this negative? Well, it's negative because we're in the tensile, this is a tensile uh, stress situation, so this bar is getting longer, so we know that it's going to strain in this direction. So we say that if the strain is such that it's getting thinner than it's a negative axial strain. So this comes out to be minus 0 
zero zero one six. So there's the the sorry I misspoke the lateral strain. I think I said axial lateral strain. Okay, now let's figure out the axial strain. The axial strain. Poisson's ratio is going to be equal to minus the lateral strain over the axial strain. We know Poisson's ratio, that's given right here, and we also just computed that guy. Okay, so we can plug in these two known quantities and solve for the axial strain epsilon, which gives epsilon equal to minus one over nu epsilon prime, and we plug the numbers in and we get 0 0.004848. Okay, now the axial stresses, so we've basically we've characterized the material, okay, we have all the geometry, we now understand the internal deformations in the material, so what we need now is to understand the internal forces as expressed through the stress. Okay, so the axial stress then, the axial stress, it's just then simply sigma equals E epsilon. We just computed this, this is given because it's an aluminum alloy and so this becomes 349.1 mega pascals. Now, what we want to check is that uh, this is okay, meaning that this stress here is in, indeed in the linear regime. We haven't exceeded the yield stress, and so we just simply look at the yield stress value, right, which in this case was 480 megapascals and you can see that 349 is indeed less than 480 so we're okay and given sigma we can actually back out the applied force P that was used in order to generate those internal stresses and deformations okay, so P is just equal to sigma A which is sigma pi r squared, since it's a circular cross-section, and then we know sigma and we know the radius, and so that comes out to be 27.42 kilonewtons. Okay, so we have, if we go back to the beginning of this problem, we now have fully characterized both the external loading P, all of the internal deformations, as well, and the internal forces and we know that we're in the linear elastic regime. So from a design and analysis perspective, we're on firm footing.